Take your Bible, if you would, please. Check the microphone. Microphone's on. So John ain't hollering at me upstairs. Turn to Exodus 20, if you would. Exodus chapter 20. Um, I had mentioned here a while back that I was praying about something to, to preach uh, in the future. And uh, I was thinking about preaching ab about the roles of how to, ha how to be a godly man in this world that we live in. Did someone drop a big chunk of money back there? Is that what... Huh? Oh, John threw it down. Why don't we gather that up before John decides he wants it back? Or Roy sneaks out there. To, I see a cane come out there and just slide it over. I don't know who did that. But I I thought about... Uh, uh, message series on and this is you know you got to do this every now and then I believe on having godly men in your church men all of us men need preached at amen we need uh, we need we need our issues preached on all of us do. I need it. You need it. Those of you men online, you need it. God has, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the Democrat Party says. I don't care what the liberals say. I don't care what anybody says. God has designed specific roles for both male and female alike. In life in general, not just church, but in this life, God has designed roles for us to live in. And I would say to you that none of us are ever going to be perfect, ever. I'm never, I will never be the perfect husband, I'll never be the perfect man, I'll never be the perfect dad, I'll never be the perfect pastor. But still, there are things that I need to work on and can work on, and I'm not, it's not too late for me to change. I don't believe you ever get too old to change and submit to God's ways in your life. Amen. I don't care if you're 80 years old and you ain't living right, you ain't too old for God to take a rod to you and chasten you and teach you how to live the right way. Okay? Uh, same thing with women. There is the world's version of what a woman is. There is God's version of what a woman is. And those two, I have found, often clash. And a lot of times they clash in the church where women will try to be worldly women in God's house, and you cannot do that. He, God will not bless that. He will curse that. He will make your life miserable. You will only feel, ladies, listen to me, you will only feel satisfied living in the role that God has made for you to live in. God is the one who designed your psychiatry. He designed your mind. He designed your heart. He knows and shaped it. He knows what works and what doesn't work. And 60 years of feminism in this country has not made our country a better nation. It has not. And so there are ways that women should conform. And again, you are never too old 
for God to not chasten you as a woman to cause you to be the type of godly woman that God wants you to be. Because in a church, it's not just us. We have a generation of young people coming up after us that are watching us. I, I can tell you 100% flat out, my role models as a young boy were the people in this church as I was growing up in it. And I got hurt by some adults that weren't doing right and living right. That hurt me as a young boy. That had an effect on me for the, that's still with me to this very day. So I'm encouraging you. I, I'm, I'm not preaching that today. I'm not giving up on it either. And then I'm going to preach to the young people. There is a way that you need to learn how to live now. Because if you do not learn how to learn it at a, and live it as a young person, all of us adults know what you're going to face when you leave mom and the safety of mom and daddy's house and are out on your own. We all know what you're going to face out there, don't we? Is it good? No, none of it is. The things that you were told as a young person, every single one of those things are going to be challenged and tested by a very lost, evil world out there. And this is where, generally, we're going to lose them. This is where, generally, we lose our church members. Is when they reach that age and they are not prepared to deal with what they are inevitably going to face. You cannot seclude children from this world and expect them to turn out okay when they're adults. It doesn't work that way. They have to be just as, just as uh, germs and sicknesses coming around need to affect our body so our body learns how to fight them off. That's how our children need to be. God didn't say beat your children and they'll turn out right. God said train a child. That means you confront them in a limited way with the enemy and his lies. And you train them to be able to work around those lies and still believe God's truths and God's morals and God's word. If we don't do that, we're going to lose this generation of young people that's in this church. I've seen it happen too many times before. But I believe God's laid a different uh, set of messages on my heart for now. So I'm going to preach them. It's going to be at least ten of them. So what am I going to preach on? Ten commandments. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And I'm just going to do it line upon line. I'm going to do it commandment upon commandment. Today, we're going, to, we're going to deal with the very first commandment that God gave. The first things that you see mentioned in the Bible usually are important. Always the first things. Christ was the firstborn. When we, when we bring in, listen to this now. For those of you who are wondering about things, when you come, when you get ready to pay your tithes, let me just give you a good example to live by. When you get ready to pay your tithes and offerings and, and get, bring them into the storehouse on Sunday morning, you know what God says to do? Bring in the first fruits. You know what that means? It means don't pay every other bill first. And then with what you have left over, give a little bit of that to God. God says, make the tithe check out first and watch as He pays all the other bills for you. How many of y'all believe that? Say amen. You've seen it happen, haven't you? As a rule, as a practice, in our, at least in our life, 
This is what God showed us that from early on. He showed us that. Pay him the tithes, bring him his part, the first fruits, into the storehouse first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I'm here to tell you that when God says he is going to be first in your life, he means first. Number one, the primary position, the chief seat. You cannot put God at the back of the bus. You cannot put him on the back row of the church. You cannot put him in the back of your mind. You must have him in the foremost part of your mind. Think about how we think about things. Say, well, I had that in the back of my mind. What does that mean? It literally means that we stuck it behind us. And sometimes we can forget about things if they're back there. But God literally, watch this, God literally put our rational, moral thinking right here in the part of the brain called the frontal lobe. This part of my brain right here is what makes moral decisions in my life. Whether I'm going to live right and do the right thing or whether I'm going to do the wrong thing. And if God is right here in the frontal lobe of your mind, I guarantee you, you will do the right things because you have sought first God's kingdom, His righteousness, and He said all these things then will be added unto you. Do you believe that? Say amen. Now, Genesis, or Exodus chapter 20. I've made a, I've made a mention many times. I, I've studied this out. I've counted this out. I'll never forget the first time I was going through numbers and looking at numbers in the Bible. And I was looking at the number 7 or the number 70 or the number 700 or 777 or 7,000. That, that's a Bible number as well. And I'll never forget when I decided one day I was going to look and see what was the 70th chapter of the Bible. 70, 7 has to do with God's perfection and completion. It has to do with God's pardoning of our sins. And when God pardons our sin, does He just pardon part of our sin? Let me ask that again since I didn't get an answer. That means you weren't listening. When, we, when God forgives our sins, does He just forgive part of our sin? That's an answer. He forgives all of our sin. It is complete. The last three words Jesus said on the cross were, It is is finished he meant what he said and if christ came and only died for part of our sin then how in the world do we expect to pay for the rest of them he's covered all of our sins and i want you to notice now in the 70th chapter that it's seven times ten well seven for completion for perfection for god's word is perfect the words of the lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified Seven times. Isn't that something, Brother George? Thou shalt keep them, thou shalt preserve them. For, that's, by the way, that's one of them verses I quoted to that lady. Thou shalt, the, God, I said, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried, purified seven times, God said he'll keep them. He preserved them for this generation forever. She went, I wasn't done. And I thought, boy, you're fixing to be. You may not realize it, but you're fixing to be. So here I am looking at, I counted up, Genesis has 50 chapters. You count over 20 more, 50 plus 20 is 70. And that puts you right here at Exodus 20 with the 10 commandments. 7 for perfection, 10 for God's law and His commandments. Now isn't that something? Now, I want you to count for me the words that are in verse 1 of your King James Bible. If it's an NIV, it won't work. You shouldn't have brought it. How many words in that first verse? Seven. Now, God grabbed me by the neck one time. I was looking at that. And God said, now, Mike, count those words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoa, that looks pretty good. God's pick all these words, sing. There's seven words there. And then God asked me the question, Mike, do you believe that? And at the time, God was really then dealing with me about this issue of whether or not this Bible was right. I had already made the confession in my office that day, somewhere around uh, November of, of, 
of 98, I think it was, somewhere around in there. But I remember the day, I remember the thought process. I had already made the confession that I believed that this Bible was right in everything that it said. But God was just going to help me along the way. And I read, actually read the words that were in verse 1. And God spake all these words saying. And then the Holy Ghost asked me, Mike, do you believe now what that what you're reading? God spake all of those words. And I said, well, yeah, in Hebrew. God said, no, not just in Hebrew. You don't speak Hebrew, Mike. God, I'm speaking to you in your language. Do you believe that I spoke all of those words in the language that you understand in English? And I said, God, I believe that. I believe that these words came out of the mouth of God. They are not life's suggestions. They are God's commandments and they are to be lived by. Somebody say amen. The reason why the devil and the ACLU and everybody else hates these words, the reason why uh, Judge Roy down in Alabama got in so much trouble is because people hate the fact that they, they know that God wrote these words and they don't want them in a courthouse. They don't want them in a jailhouse. They don't want them in a schoolhouse. And if the truth be known, half the churches don't even want them in the church house anymore. Because people are saying, well, we don't live by the law anymore. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. And it's even gotten to the point to where people... Good grief, it's noon already. Y'all stand and we'll be dismissed. <laughs> Sit down, Roy. People don't even... In churches, people don't even want to believe that they have to keep these commandments. They call it extreme grace. They say, I can commit adultery, I can drink all the whiskey I want, I can do all the drugs I want, I can sin all the sin I want, and God will still save me. That's a lie. That is called tempting God, and the Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Somebody say amen. So God speak all these words saying, Now notice what he said, I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Commandment number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let me say that again. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless this message. I know we're running late. So, Lord, help me to do my best to convey this in a short amount of time as possible. Get to the root of it, get to the meat of it, get to the heart of it. And speak to, uh, uh, Father, I know I'm not preaching to a bunch of lost people. I'm preaching to people who say they're saved. I have no reason to believe they're not. But Father, the question that we must ask is, are we guilty of breaking even the first commandment in our daily activities, in our lifestyle, where we put prayer, where we put Bible reading in our daily life, when it comes to making decisions that we have to make, moral decisions that we have to make, do we choose to do the right thing or do we choose to do the wrong thing? And is there, in fact, things that get in the way of God in our lives? Is there something in anybody's life this morning that gets in the way between them and God? Is it their pride? Is it their ego? Is it their hard heart? Is it television? Is it radio? Is it the internet? Father, what is it that in each one of us comes between us and you? 
The Lord, show us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said. Let me read you about our God for a minute. Let me show you just how great our God really is. Exodus 15, 11, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Yes, there are other gods. They are the angelic realm. There are good angels. There are evil angels. The question to ask is, Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Is there any God, lesser God, that God has created that is as good to you as God has been good to you? Is there another angel, is there another God that has been merciful to you the way God has been merciful to you? Has not God forgiven every one of your stupid sins? Somebody say amen. Has he not been gracious to you? Has he not blessed you? Has he not given you a place to live, food to eat? Has he not given you clothes on, it, on your back? Has he, not, has he not been there in your worst times possible? Has he not helped you on your worst days? Has he not forgiven you of your worst things that you've ever done in your life? Has he not forgiven you? Exodus 18, 11, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. That is why they call him the Most High God. Psalm 82, 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, and he judgeth among the gods. There is one judge who will judge both gods and men, and that is God. We don't judge God. We don't judge God. God judges us. Angels, Lucifer, cannot judge God. God will judge him. Psalm 86, 8, Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Psalm 95, 3, For the Lord is great, and a great king above all gods. Psalm 96, 4, For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised, he is to be feared above all gods. Psalm 136, 2, O give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth Forever. There is no... I met a man last week who said he was a former Muslim. Let me tell you about Islam. There is no mercy in Islam. There's no forgiveness. There's no, there's no sacrificial atonement for the sins of mankind or for those Muslims. They believe that they must wash themselves. They believe that they must purify themselves. They believe they must... Uh, perform deeds and acts of purification in order to perform themselves. They must believe, they believe that they must come up to the level of Allah, but God, God, Allah, does not come down to the level of man. How sad that is. Now I explained that to the man when he tried to tell me that he believed that all gods were the same God. And I said, sir, respectfully, I'm going to tell you, you say you used to be a, a Muslim. Well, according to Islam, Allah had no son. But according to the Bible, God gave His only begotten Son to be the sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of all mankind. For the things that you have done wrong and the things that I have done wrong. Those two gods cannot be the same God. And he said, you know, that's a good point. You pray for that man. Uh, let's see here, where was I? His mercy endureth forever. Psalm 138.1 I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I don't care how many devils are surrounding you and beating on you and chewing you up. Put in your favorite gospel song. Turn the radio on and sing just as loud as you can. When they're all around you, you're going to give praise to God no matter what. Somebody say amen. Now, this is not in my notes. Take your Bible. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. While you're turning there, one of our families that follows us sent me an email and it caught my eye 
And it said a new English translation of the New Testament specifically aimed toward conveying Christian beliefs through Native American culture concepts and storytelling has been released. Something you need to know about Indians, Native Americans, First Nations up in Canada is that, that they have no book that they follow for their creeds and their doctrines and their religious beliefs. It's done by the way of storytelling. Storytelling always corrupts the story every time it's told and for every generation it's told to the story is remembered different, remembered wrong and passed down in a corrupt form. So they decided, well it would be a good idea then to take that idea of Indian storytelling and try to compose a New Testament that's written in that form so that Native American people, indigenous people, will not get offended by what's in the Bible. Now, I've known some people who have been Native American, First Nations, or have tried to minister to those people. They are very difficult to minister to, and the, the one reason is they absolutely refuse to give up their Native American or First Nations heritage, which includes their religious beliefs. Let me tell you something. The God that we believe in is not the Great Spirit. He isn't. The Great Spirit of all the Native American traditions is not the single, only God that they serve. Our God is the only God that can be served. How many gods are there? One God. So their great spirit is not the same as our God. So here's what they did with, here's, here's John 3, 16, according to the King James. For, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now here is the, what, here, let me just tell you what it's called. It's called the First Nations Version. This is John 3.16. The Great Spirit loves this world of human beings so deeply. He gave us His Son, the only Son who fully represents Him. All who trust in Him and His way will not come to a bad end, but will have the life of the world to come that never fades full of beauty and harmony. It's not the same gospel. And Paul said if we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel let him be accursed. I have you there in John chapter 1 verse 1. This is what God laid on my heart between Sunday school and church. This is the direction I'm going to take it this morning. In the beginning, read this out loud with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Keep reading with me out loud. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. Now look at verse 14 and read that out loud with me. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so in just in case in your mind or in somebody else's mind there's any misunderstanding about who the Word is that's identified in John chapter 1, the Word is the one who became flesh and dwelt among us. That Word then is Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Say Amen. So now let me read this commandment again. And I want you to think of it in relation to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
And the Word was what? God. So is the Word God? Is this God? Yes. A thousand times yes. A million times yes. This book is not only the Word of God, it is the very nature and essence of Jesus Christ and it is God in this world. He is the Word and the Word is Him and there is no difference between the two. So when I read Exodus chapter 20 and it says, I am the Lord which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me if this is God, what does that mean? It means that if you're going to get your beliefs, your doctrine, your hope, your comfort, help in time of struggles, if you're going to want to know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, then it should come from this book and not come from any other place. Somebody say amen. Now, turn in your Bible to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here I go again. I'm going to preach this message until some of you get it. The message is, you should never believe what the internet says on face value. Amen. You should not believe your favorite websites, your favorite blogs, your, your favorite video watchman broadcast. You should not believe anything if you have not first learned to believe it from the Word of God, period. Amen. If you do, you are putting another God between you and this God right here. In other words, your belief system is primarily based on the internet and what it says and only secondarily based on what the Word of God says. So now the Word of God is interpreted subject to what the internet said. And that, thank you. I got one applause, I'm going to preach till 1.30. <laughs> 2 o'clock. That came from my mama and my sister back there going, shh. 2 <laughs> Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 3. Let the man deceive you by how? Any means, any website, any video, any blog, anything. Some of you people, maybe in this church, I don't know, but I know there's a bunch of you out there online that are guilty, 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 guilty of forming your ideas and your attitudes and your eschatology, your beliefs about the future and what is going to happen, you are guilty of basing your beliefs on those things on what the internet says rather than what the Word of God says. You have put another God between you and this God that saved you. This God this God was trying to preach at you when you were in a bar one night. 
This, this God was holding your hair back while you were puking your guts up in a toilet. This God was with you when you were out of drugs and you were shaking and crying. I need, it. I need another fix. I can't, I can't deal with this. This God was with you the whole time. He never left you. This God was with you when you were ready to blow your brains out and kill yourself and take your own life. This God was with you. He never left you. He was trying to give you words of comfort. He was trying to give you words of hope. He was trying to tell you it's not as bad as what you think it is. This God saved your life over and over and over again, did He not? So why then, after you've come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through this book, would you then devote, and people, you may not be like this, and you may not, some of you may not comprehend what I'm about to tell you. But I'm telling you, there are literally people who can't wait to get out of their beds in the morning while they're still in their pajamas to turn the computer on to see what else has come through their emails, what new blog has been written about COVID or COVID vaccines or chemtrails or depopulation programs or this, or that, and, and Trump conspiracy theories, and everything. They can't wait to get out of bed every day to go suckle from the breasts of the internet. And they're hooked on that. And they stay that way for hours and hours and hours. And because one of those websites had a verse of scripture on it, they count that as Bible reading for the day. But they won't read this book. And this book saved their life. It saved their marriage. It saved their soul. It saved everything about this book. Never left them nor forsaken them. And yet they have taken another God. And put it between them and this God here. Let, them, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And who are we talking about in this verse? The Antichrist. He has taken the place of God Himself, including the seat of God. You know where the seat of God is right now? It's right here. The seat of God is right here. And you've gotten caught up. See, I know this because God let me do it for a little while. God let me do it for a little while. And I know what it's like to catch yourself looking up everything else under the sun but not turning to the Word of God. I know what that's like. God chastised me. God corrected me. God changed me. God forgave me. And now, I no longer see it as a bore. I don't see it as some drudge, drudgery thing that I do. 
that I must, I got to read the Bible or I can't do anything else. I find myself coming in here wanting to know what else this Bible says because I don't know it all. And I'm happier that way. I don't know if you've noticed a change in my general attitude, but I've gotten better with the depression and the anxiety. I'm smiling more than I used to be. Part of it is because I'm not reading the junk that I was reading on the internet that was literally scaring me to death. Turn to Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> I preached this at another church, but let me, just in a couple minutes, and I'm going to let you go, let me share with this church how the internet works. Just so you'll understand. The people who are writing all of the right-wing conservative websites that you go to are making a fortune right now. Now that Biden's in office. They're making a fortune. And let me, let me tell you how. Every time you go to, I used to go to the Drudge Report, but they turned liberal, so I quit going to them. And I was going to another website, I will not name them, but I was going to a website, and it looked like the Drudge Report. But they had all conservative stories on there. So I was going to them. The mere fact that I went to that website, the website owner got paid a bunch of money right then. Because he had ads all over his first page where all the news articles were linked to. And then, if I clicked on an article to read it and was directed from his site to another site, he got paid then by me clicking on that article. He got a piece of the advertisements that were on the page that I went to. And a whole nother article came up that was surrounded by advertisements. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Those advertisements. You can't even hardly find the article anymore. And sure enough, you're trying to read something. All of a sudden, something pops up in there wanting you to subscribe or unblock and this and that and the other. All of that is money that's trading hands. All of that is. And when you get to one of these websites that you're reading the story on, some some story about how some teacher did this to the classroom. Oh, that's so terrible! Well, it's got 20 ads around it. And the guy's making money off of every one of those ads. It doesn't matter to him if the story really is true or not. It only matters to him that you read it and he got paid for it. All they care of, what is the love of money? The root of all evil. That's how it works. Plus, they've got your, they've got your home internet address now in their database. They know what stories you look at. That data is sold. Data right now is worth more than gold and titanium and silver put together in this country. It is a high value currency. They know everything there is to know about you by your internet habits. Including some websites you probably don't want everybody knowing that you go to. They know. They know. So Ezekiel 28 the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. 
I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. And with thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee what? What's that next word? Riches. What does the devil represent? Those who seek the riches of this world, the wealth of this world. And has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches. And thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. And you're over here saying, oh, that liberal news. I don't watch that liberal news stuff. I only watch Fox every now and then. And then I only go to certain of these conservative websites over here on, on the internet. That's the only ones I listen to. And, and I watch this video. I watch bit shoot videos. I don't go to YouTube anymore. And on and on and on and on. And I'm telling you that 80 to 90% of that stuff is nothing but pure lies. And it's replaced God in your mind and in your heart. You believe that stuff, you'll fight and die for those, belief, those things that you're reading on the internet. You will fight and die for those and wait till you find out that you gave your life for something that wasn't true. The devil is good about mixing truths with lies, is he not? That's what he does. Isaiah 14. And I'm going to be done. So already I'm going to preach two sermons on God first commandment maybe not verse 12 Isaiah 14 verse 12 how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations for thou hast said in thine heart I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds seven words Last thing he said, seven words. I will be like the most high. So what's happened is that already in some people's minds, the devil has already assumed a position that is between you and God because what you believe is based upon what you read the videos you watch the things that you see the things that you listen to they're determined by those things. And since those things did not originate from this book, you believe a lie. But you don't believe that. You don't believe it. And I tell you, I've tried for years to get people to put down their books, their TV shows, their internet news sites, their YouTube videos, their bit shoot videos, all of the internet gossip that goes around sold as truth to get them to put those down pick up a Bible and do what I did just start just pick it up somewhere and start reading it and let God be first in your life telling you what to believe and what's true now I'm going to three o'clock no, I'm not. I'm done. <laughs> Give me.
Give me that Hardy's card back, Roy. People, bow your head for a second. Uh, listen, I'm dead serious on this. Because I want to tell you what I know. While you're with your, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going, to, I'm going to shoot straight with you. That way you're not looking at me. There is coming to this world a strong delusion. It is a delusion that is going to be so strong that if it were possible, it would deceive the truly elect. But that's not going to happen. God will not allow the truly elect to be deceived. And my feelings on this are very strong. Very strong. I am trying every way I can to compel you, to beg you, to plead with you with tears in my eyes. Shouting to you. Speaking calmly to you. Begging you. To get off the social media. Get off the tweets, the Facebooks, the videos, the blogs. Get off that junk. And don't go back to it until... You believe that you are sufficiently grounded in the Word of God. But what could very well happen is God just may change all your appetites and you just might say, you know what? I just don't feel like sucking on that internet junk anymore. I'd rather read my Bible than anything. That's what I'm really hoping God does with you. Because there's a mark coming to those who will be deceived and it's highly possible that people hearing my voice right now will go stand in line and get that mark and all because you refused to know the truth of the mark you refused God's salvation so because of that, God turns you over to believe a strong delusion, to believe a lie. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to my wife, any of my children, any of their wives or husbands, any of my grandchildren, or anybody in this church or anybody who follows our ministry. Those who are in Kenya who hate me because you're following the false prophet Dr. O'War, if you get away from that man for about a month and just read your Bible, God will show you what kind of big liar he is. And I guarantee you, you wouldn't want to go back to him ever again. So put God's word, which is God, first. Because God, he already said, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. He wasn't asking. He was commanding. And if you're going to be his child, when he commands, you're going to obey. The Father, I come before you today in the name of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Word of God, the Word that was made flesh, the Word infallible. And I'm begging you, Father, make converts today. Convert people today from thinking that their theology and their Beliefs about end time events are all to be found somewhere on the internet. 
like I did. And you corrected me. Help them, dear God, to be converted over to putting you first and your word first so that they are full of the knowledge of the word of God and they're going to keep your commandments and they're never going to let them go and they're always going to be the basis of their truth filter. And when they see something on the internet or hear somebody say something, they're going to automatically know it's a lie. Because your word was in their heart and they knew it. Just like that woman that came to me last weekend. Father, had I not been somewhat knowledgeable of what the scripture said, I might have been pulled in by her false doctrine. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, make some converts today. Convert them over from suckling on the vine of the internet, the vine of the news, and the vine of neighbors' philosophies and family members' rumors. And convert them over, dear God, to where they only will know and believe your holy word. Let them put God first in the form of your word in their life. And let it be that way forever. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please?